Good morning and welcome all. I'll remind you that where two or three are gathered, where God is with us and we may worship him. Uh, we are over that quota. So, uh, A couple of announcements. Youth, there's no meeting tonight, but a reminder that there is a youth meeting, uh, a, a youth party, Christmas party, December 6th at the Hicks from 3 to 6. Okay, cool. So take note of that. Uh, and I believe that's all the announcements that we had. Uh, let me just say that whether you had a great week or a terrible one, whether um, you're here looking forward to a joyful worship service or whether you dragged yourself here just out of habit, welcome. Welcome in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a God who sees, who knows, who loves all of his people well. So I encourage you to turn your eyes on him this morning to your perfect Heavenly Father, who did not withhold his own Son uh, out of his love for you. Let us hear our God call us to his worship from Psalm 33. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we gather this morning to worship you. Please turn our hearts and souls away from our troubles, away from the earthly things that we trust in, and toward you this morning, that you would be glorified and we would be renewed. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Please take your bulletins and stand, and we will sing together, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Will not prosper. He who can 
confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. Take a few moments to silently confess your sins of this week before our life. Dear brothers and sisters, our God does not leave us in our sin. Hear his assurance of pardon from Romans 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging that you are God that you are our King and our Sovereign. And Father, we have not always served you well. Father, we plead with you for strength to honor you in all the tasks and all the interactions and relationships that you have set before us. Father, please strengthen us to do all these things for your glory. Father, we plead for ourselves, for our little congregation, for us in this weird time, uh, when many things that we would normally do can't happen, Father, we pray that you would help us as we respond to this pandemic, help us to do so with wisdom and grace and mercy on others. Father, we pray that you would give us a Christ-centered attitude to love others as well as we can. Father, we pray that you would have mercy on us, that we would be uh, safe from the pandemic, from this virus. And Father, if, you, if it is your will that we catch it, Father, please be with us in it. Father, we pray for relief from this pandemic. We pray for those working on a vaccine. We pray that uh, that whole system of healthcare workers, of researchers, of those who will be giving the vaccine, uh, that you will bless in all ways, uh, that we would have relief from this. Father, we pray for your grace on our health care workers uh, as they are facing this new surge of cases. Father, we pray that you would give them patience. Father, pray that you would give them the skill they need to help those who are, um, who are sick. Father, we plead that we would be salt and light in a world that badly needs your hope and the healing of your gospel. Father, whatever circumstances you have brought to us, Father, you are God and your gospel is true. Help us to know that deep down in our souls. Father, we plead for our missionaries we support. We plead for the Smoky Mountain Pregnancy Care Center. Father, we pray for those who still work there. We pray that you would bless and strengthen them to help mothers in need. Father, we pray that you would uh, protect and guard life uh, through this organization. Father, we pray that you would bless also Ridge Haven as they have canceled so many things, we pray that you would help them to <clears throat> be financially stable. Uh, Father, we pray that you would uh, help them to plan well for all the events that they would like to do this coming year. Uh, give them wisdom uh, in what they do and don't do. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we continue your worship this morning. May it be an honor and a glory to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Once again, welcome to Redeemer. Glad you're here this morning. Uh, you see the candle over here, Advent, believe it or not. Thanksgiving was just a few days away, but here we are starting uh, the first Sunday of Advent. And the first candle we light represents hope. And so with that in mind, we're going to begin a five-week journey looking at the women in Jesus' genealogy, particularly through the aspect of hope today. And so if you look in your bulletin, you'll see one verse. I'm actually not going to preach out of Romans 15. Uh, but it's a verse I'm going to use later for the benediction, and it's, it's filled with uh, the God of hope, and it seemed appropriate to kind of set the stage as we look at Genesis 38 this morning. So hear God's word from Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. 
Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for its timeless and eternal truth. Pray now that you give us ears to hear what you have to say. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We are very blessed in this country to live in a land of what I would call choices. We get to choose pretty much anything and everything every single day. But there's a couple of things that we don't get to choose. And I tend to think about these things during Thanksgiving and the holidays. For example, we don't get to choose our family. You ever notice that? The family that you're born into or the family that you're adopted into. And if we're honest, if I'm honest, there's probably some that maybe I might say, I wish Uncle Ed wasn't a part of the family. (laughs) Or why does so-and-so have to be here this year? i got to hear politics stuff yet again and and so forth. The other thing we don't get to choose is actually our spiritual family. Um, God does that as well. I mention that because as we look at the genealogy of Jesus, he got to choose his family because he's God. So he chose a particular time in human history. He chose a particular race of people. And even among that race of people, he chose a particular lineage to incarnate, to come and dwell among sinful people. There's five women in Jesus' genealogy, and to our Western woke ears, to use that language, that might be offensive to some. The truth is, the fact that there are any women mentioned is pretty extraordinary for this reason. The Jewish people always kept records according to the male lineage. And so that's how inheritances were passed down from generation to generation. If you look in the Gospel of Luke, there's actually no women mentioned in the genealogy. If you look in Matthew One, you will see the five that we're going to look at. Obviously, there was more than five women, but these five are ones that are mentioned. It's Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. And as we look at these stories, starting even today, we're going to uh, see pretty extraordinary stories, actually. Stories of women that were broken by their own sin, as well as the sin of other people. Uh, We're going to see some incredible acts of bravery and faith, and just some outright sin, as well as some questionable decisions that quite honestly might unnerve us a little bit. Four of these five women were Gentiles, uh, which shows us even from the get-go that God had a heart for the nations. Um, All five of these women were involved in what I would call either a scandalous situation or a perceived scandalous situation. I say that because of Mary. Mary, of course, was pregnant with Jesus, but not because of any immorality on her part. So the question is, why these five? It's a question I keep coming back to. Why not some of the other ladies in Jesus' history? Why not Sarah, uh, the great mother of faith? I think it's this. I think that God is trying to show us what I would call the scandalous nature of grace. It's messy, like our lives, right? Uh, Jesus enters into a family history full of deceit and selfishness, one that's full of sexual sin and greed, idolatry and faithfulness. And he identifies with truly rebellious people. He says, these people are mine. I came for them. Today we're going to be looking at Genesis 38. If you have scripture with you, I'd encourage you to turn to Genesis 38. Um, I am not going to read the entire chapter for several reasons. Number one, time. We're trying to be a little cognitive with, obviously, the COVID situation still going on. Uh, The other issue is this is a pretty scandalous chapter. It's a difficult chapter to read. It's an uncomfortable chapter to read at parts. And so I'm going to uh, paraphrase the story, tell the story. I will quote some actual verses from Genesis 38 and point us to some, but I'm trying to be cognitive of parents of little ones who may not be ready to have certain conversations just yet about certain topics. So Genesis 38, if you have scripture, you can follow along. Uh, This is the story of a man named Judah and Tamar. And so if you've ever read Genesis, then you know in Genesis 37 through the end of the book, chapter 50, Joseph is kind of the main player or the main human player, I should say. His story starts off in Genesis 37 and then it picks back up in 39. And then we have the story that we're going to look at today in Genesis 38. When we first read it, I remember in college reading this thinking, what in the world is God doing? This sounds so weird. It seems to kind of interrupt the flow of Joseph. There doesn't seem to be a connection, uh, but there actually is a connection. Um, And here's the connection. It tells the story of Judah, who was one of Joseph's brothers. He was the fourth son of Jacob. Remember, Jacob had multiple wives, but Judah's mother was, was Leah. And so when chapter 38 opens... We see Judah move away from his homeland, move away from his family, 
move away from the covenant family into the land of the Canaanites, which would have been a no-no for God's people. On top of that, he becomes pretty good friends with a Canaanite. And then a little bit later, he meets another guy, and he really likes his daughter. If you look at the early verses in chapter 38, there's no development of their relationship, uh, as one person pointed out. Uh, It doesn't seem to be love at first sight. It seems to be lust at first sight. But he simply takes this woman, he marries her, and she bears him three children. Those three children are three sons, um, Er, Onan, and Shelah. When Er is of age, a wife is given to him. Uh, Her name is Tamar. If you have your scripture open, you can follow along. I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. We don't know much about Tamar. We don't know much about Er. In their relationship, we're just given these two verses. And Judah took a wife for Er, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. This is very significant. This is actually the first time that an individual is killed for his or own sin individually. Up to this point, it's been groups of people. You may recall Sodom and Gomorrah. God obviously placed his just wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah, but that was a collective thing, if you will. We don't know what this man did. The level of his wickedness or his sin is not given any detail for us, but we know that he was wicked and God took his life. Very reminiscent of the verse in Ezekiel where it says that the soul that sins is the soul that shall die. Um, This is where the story takes its first kind of uncomfortable turn. So many of you are probably familiar with this, but in the Old Testament, they had what was called Leverite marriage. This is what that meant. If a woman was married and her husband was killed or died kind of early, then if that man had any relatives, particularly brothers, it was the brother's job to marry the widow and then provide children for uh, the widow. It was kind of like a social security system, if you will. It was kind of a way of ensuring that the widows and the children would be cared for. Um, but what would happen is, is that even though the wife would have biological children with the other brother, they would be considered the deceased husband's children, which means inheritance time, the inheritance would be split even more so that everybody was cared for and covered. I mention that because this man, Onan, heir's brother, knew that. He knew that any children that Tamar would have bore would not have been considered his, but would have been considered his brother's, which meant less money, for lack of better words, or less resources for he and his family. As a result, he took what I would call sinful precautions to ensure that Tamar did not get pregnant. And as a result, we get to verse 10. What he did, what Onan did, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. So now we have two sons, uh, both died. We know why one of them died. We don't know why the other did. This causes Judah to be incredibly fearful. Dad is starting to think, wait a minute, I'm down two sons. There's only one left. What's going on? Verse 11, Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. Um, We don't know exactly what was going through the mind of Judah, obviously, possibly he was thinking, man, is this girl bad luck or something? But she, he seems to be blaming her. But he says, listen, my youngest boy is not of age yet. Get to wait till he grows up. So you go and live with your father. I will send for you and I will give you to him when the time comes. Um, again, an uncomfortable event happens next. So time marches on. Judah's wife dies. Um, after that time of grieving, he goes on what I would call a business trip to shear some sheep. There was a particular route that he would take in a particular area he would go. Well, uh, his daughter-in-law, Tamar, knew this. She also knew that Sheila was grown up now, and she was not being given to him as a wife. So she devised a plan, and her plan was this. She took off her widow's garments, and she put a veil. How appropriate that I'm looking at all the veils (laughs) as we speak. But she put a veil over her face, went and stood on the side of the road, and when Judah came to her, he made an assumption about her. He assumed that she was uh, there to work in a particular capacity. Uh, He didn't just make that assumption because of the veil over her face. That might have been part of it. But the truth is is that women that were betrothed uh, in the ancient East would often wear veils across their faces. But she was by herself, and that was kind of the telltale sign. She never says this is what she is. He just makes an assumption and says, hey, uh, I'd like to secure your services, you know. And she gets straight to the point, okay, what are you going to give me? Uh, What do I get for this? And he says, well, I got a goat. I'll give you a young goat. I'll send it to you. Well, well, 
that's great, that sounds fair, but how do I know you're going to do that? What kind of pledge will you give me to prove that this will happen? Well, what do you want? And she very wisely says, well, how about you give me your signet, give me your cord, give me, give me your staff. These things don't mean very much to us, but in modern equivalence, it's like he left his wallet or an ID card or maybe even a credit card because these items really had two functions. Number one, they enabled Judah to and conduct commerce with others in the area. Number two, they were forms of identification, which is why she asked for them. So he gives them to her, and then he leaves. The next day, he, or say the next day, shortly after, he sends a servant with the goat, but obviously the woman is not there. He goes back and tells his master, hey, listen, I, I went, but uh, there was no lady there. And on top of that, I asked the townspeople, hey, where's the lady who, who lives here and, and works in this area? We don't know what you're talking about. There, there's no lady there we have no idea who you're referring to and so Judah said well listen you're my witness I did the right thing I tried to send the goat she wasn't there she can just keep the items that she has and be done with it and so he doesn't think anything more until a few months later three months later we're told in the scripture that uh, Tamar is pregnant we know why she is pregnant obviously and so as soon as he is told he burns with anger in fact uh, the scripture tells us that he demands that she be brought out and burned, burned at the stake right uh, then and there. Pretty intense uh, hatred, to be honest. But before that happens, she says, listen, please send these items to my father-in-law with this message. I am pregnant by the man to whom these belong. And so we get to verse 26 in his response. He is cut to the quick. She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her my son, Sheila. He admitted that he had purposely kept his son from her. Uh, he admitted that he's kind of been caught to use that uh, language. This is a significant turning point in Judah's life, which we'll look at in just a second. Uh, the story continues, and we read uh, several key things. Number one, he was never intimate with Tamar again. And number two, she gave birth to not one but two sons. So why in the world would your pastor choose this as our opening story for Advent, right? Uh, such a cheery Christmas story, right? Well, with that in mind, remember the key word hope today. I just want to make three quick observations about uh, biblical hope from this particular story. Number one, biblical hope always comes to the undeserving. Or another way to say that is, is that anyone who receives or benefits from biblical hope is undeserving of that hope. Uh, Judah is obviously a great example of this. Um, if you have a Bible, you can look later, but Genesis 37 is our first encounter with Judah. And our first encounter with him is he agrees with his brothers that he doesn't like Joseph. He stops short of killing Joseph, but he has no problem engaging in human trafficking. He has no problem selling Joseph and even profiting off of that. On top of that, he has no problem coming up with a plan to lie to dad to say, listen, this is what happened to Joseph. We're so sorry, but an animal obviously got him. Joseph is no more. Maybe that's why he left in Genesis 38. Maybe he felt guilty. Uh, maybe he just wanted to get away with the family. Uh, we don't know. But the point is he left home, got away from family um, as well. Um, the other thing that we don't know about um, Judah is what kind of parent uh, was he? We're, we're not, real, uh, not real sure. What I mean by that is why didn't he correct error? Why didn't he correct Onan? It's possible he did not know what Onan was doing, obviously. But there doesn't really seem to be a lot of involvement on his end. And then if you even just look at the decisions he made here, um, purposely keeping Sheila from Tamar and even being very quick to judge her when she is accused of immorality. Um, there's a lesson for us, particularly as parents. We need to beware hypocrisy in our own lives. I see it all the time in my own life. So often the things that my kids are struggling with or have done or are doing are things that either I have done or quite honestly maybe I am doing or maybe I, I will do. But he's so quick to judge others. It's just a reminder uh, to us that biblical hope when it comes, it always comes to people that are undeserving. Judah, Tamar, you and me. Secondly, biblical hope doesn't just come to the undeserving, but actually changes the undeserving. Again, we looked at uh, Judah for just a second, but let's see how he was changed. I'm not saying that God saved Judah right then and there. I obviously don't know. 
But I think this is a, t- a turning point for this reason. I mentioned kind of all the bad stuff that he did and he struggled with. Well, what happened after this particular incident? Well, for starters, he treated Tamar, uh, Tamar with very honorable and noble intentions. He cared for her and he cared for the children. That, that's a start. On top of that, he fully admits, listen, she's more righteous than I am. Um, he doesn't even accuse her anymore to use that language. Also, if you go to Genesis uh, 40, 42, I can't remember the exact chapters, but basically the rest of Joseph's story, you probably know it well. You know that Joseph was in charge of Egypt, right? The famine's in the land. The brothers come. They need food. He asks about their family, and when he finds out the younger brother, which he knew he had, he said, listen, you can't get food until you bring him to see me. You've got to prove to me you're telling me the truth. So the brothers go back to Jacob and say, listen, we have to bring Benjamin with us. This guy down there, this kind of second in command, will not give us the food unless we bring the younger brother. Jacob says, there's no way. I've already lost Joseph. There's no way I'm losing my youngest son. And then one of the brothers stands up and says, listen, Dad, here's the deal. Please entrust your, your son to us. I give my life for his. I pledge my life. If I don't bring him back to you, then my life is forfeit. That brother was Judah. Kind of hard to believe considering the events up to Genesis 38 and 38, uh, but it's him because biblical hope changes sinners. Sinners like Judah, sinners like you and me. Um, This isn't the best illustration, but it's the best illustration I could think of this week. Uh, My boys have been running cross country for the past couple of weeks at their respective school, at the high school and with the middle school district team. And they've been on the teams now for, I don't know, three, three and a half months. And there was a start date when they were a part of the team. One day they weren't on the team. The next day they were on the team. But they are much better runners today than they were three and a half months ago. They're quicker. Their muscles are getting stronger. And why is that? Because there's been change. There's been growth. They've obviously watched their diets. They uh, exercise at home, they exercise at school, after school, etc. My point is, is that is what biblical Christianity looks like. When God brings hope to us, he saves us, and then he goes to work. He starts chipping away the old, the impatience, or the lustful thoughts, or the, the greed, or the idolatrous thoughts, and he starts putting in the new to use that language. So biblical hope comes to the undeserving. Biblical hope uh, brings change. And lastly, biblical hope always points to Jesus, always. I say that because we live in a world that can be so cynical, and yet this time of year, this same cynical world is a world that abounds in hope and talks about hope. You go to the stores and you hear the songs, right? Good tidings to you, to you and your tent, your kin. Good tidings for Christmas and a happy new year. Or we hear this, have yourself a very merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. From now on, your troubles will be out of sight, or tis the season to be jolly. These are great sentiments, but without faith, they're empty. Now, sometimes hear people say, you just have to have faith. You have to keep the faith. Well, that's a great statement, but it's pointless if the faith is not in Jesus Christ. Um, People place their faith in a lot of things. Sometimes it's family. Sometimes it's their abilities. Sometimes, quite honestly, it's in ourselves. But biblical hope or biblical faith always points to Jesus. From Genesis chapter 3, where God is judging sin, and he says, here's the good news. I am going to send one. I'm going to send the chosen one. He is going to come through your lineage to conquer sin, to conquer the servant, to even today in Genesis 38. If you have your scriptures still open, follow with me. I'm just going to read the last couple of verses of this chapter. Uh, This is when Tamar is going into labor. Verse 27, when the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. After his brother came out, the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zira. So we see this kind of unusual birth of twins, if you will. The firstborn starts to be born, but then the younger kind of sneaks in. Uh, boy, what a t- picture of what sibling relationships is often right, like, right? Uh, but his name is significance. It, Perez means to breach. So it's almost like the author of Genesis is trying to tell us something very significant is going to happen 
through this line, through the lineage of Perez. And that's exactly what happens. It's through this lineage that the kings of Israel would come. Uh, Think of King David. This is his ancestors that we're reading about. Most importantly, it's the ancestors of Jesus, the king of kings. Uh, Real biblical hope is not empty platitudes or words that are devoid of any real power. Real biblical hope always points to Jesus. Uh, Consider these well-known verses in the New Testament. Galatians 2.16. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law. Okay, Paul, so if it's not works, how are they justified? But through faith, but specifically through faith in Jesus Christ. Or Hebrews 12.2. The author tells us to look to Jesus. Why Jesus? He's the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Or Jesus' own words from John eleven twenty five. 25. We often hear this at funerals. I have quoted this many times at funerals. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You know, Jesus doesn't say, whoever believes in my teaching, you know, whoever can quote me, You know, whoever believes in my philosophy of life, whoever believes in me, biblical hope always points to Jesus. One last thing as we wrap up is this. The account this morning of Judah and Tamar reminds us that God is a God of justice. Tamar had been wronged. She was seeking justice. I'm not saying that her methods or her actions were right, but her motive certainly appeared to be she wanted justice. She had endured not one, but two bad husbands. She had endured a father-in-law who was manipulative and who had lied to her, who seemed to jump at the opportunity uh, to get rid of her. Even Judah recognized this in that verse 26, in which he said, she is more righteous than I. Tamar needed someone to identify with her plight. And through extraordinary circumstances that are a bit uncomfortable to read, this person, ironically, would be the very person who caused her struggles to begin with. We too need someone to identify with in our plight, and that someone, of course, is Jesus. But here's the amazing difference between Jesus and, of course, Judah. Jesus is not the author of our injustice. We are, and sometimes other people. Uh, Jesus is not the author of our struggles. We are, and sometimes other people are. Jesus is not the author of our sin. I am. You are. We are. And yet Jesus chooses to identify with us, sinful, selfish, weak, hard-hearted though we may be. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, the Shekinah glory of God would come and reside over the temple, the tabernacle, uh, as a way to show God's people, I am with you. I am the God who is with his people. First, there was the traveling tabernacle, of course, that we read in the Old Testament. Then there was the permanent structure in Jerusalem that uh, David's son Solomon built. Um, There is still a tabernacle today, but it's not a physical structure. It's actually a person. The reason we have so much hope, even in this difficult year, even as we say, Lord, please let 2021 come and let's close the book on 2020. Well, several thoughts there. Number one, uh, what makes us think 2021 is going to be any better? You know, things are still going to be difficult as long as the Lord tarries. uh, But we have hope because of Christ. John 114 Uh, John tells us that Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He is the living tabernacle, to use that language. How astounding is that? The glory of God chooses not to reside in the world's prettiest church or in the world's oldest church. The glory of God says, I'm going to come and live among sinful, selfish, deceitful people. People like Judah, people like Tamar, people like you, in me. We have so much to be hopeful for as 2020 comes to a close and 2021 begins. Please pray with me. Our God and our King, Father, we do thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for this somewhat obscure and even maybe weird text to us about Judah and Tamar. For Father, in it we see ourselves, we see our own greed, we see our own immorality we see our own failures to do the things that you've called us to do and yet father this text prepares our hearts prepares us for the coming of the messiah prepares us for the lord jesus who became flesh and made his dwelling among his people father thank you for the lord jesus we pray lord as we go to this week and this holiday season that you have called us to as lee prayed even a few moments ago may we be salt and light father may we point people 
to only the true source of biblical hope where it is found, and that's in Christ alone. In his worthy name we pray, amen. Please stand together. We're going to sing a shortened version of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel as we conclude our worship service together this morning. Before I give a benediction, it seems like we are probably small enough here this morning uh, that you can disperse on your own, but certainly please continue social uh, distancing as you do so. If you have a chance, stick around maybe outside for a moment or two. Ask someone how you can be praying for them this week. Um, tell them how they can be praying for you. Now, as you go to the week the Lord has called you to, the beginning of this Advent season, I offer His blessing to you in His name. May the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And all God's people said, Amen.